Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Chetan Sharma, and I have the honor uh, to moderate the panel. Uh, what we will be discussing is the future of wireless, um, from mobile ads to mobile payments and everything in between. Uh, let me quickly introduce the panel, and then we'll get into uh, some discussion around uh, the future of wireless. Uh, <clears throat> to my immediate left is uh, Dr. Hugh Bradlow, uh, CTO of uh, Telstra. Uh, who is responsible for investigating the future uh, technologies that will have an impact on the company's business. Uh, before that, he was professor at the uh, University of Wollongong in Australia and uh, received his um, uh, PhD in experimental nuclear physics from the University of Oxford. Uh, to his immediate left is um, Gary Roshak, who has been uh, in the mobile data industry before there was a in mobile data industry. Um, is currently uh, VP uh, of advertising at Yahoo. Uh, prior to that, he was uh, VP at uh, MarchX and has worked uh, on a number of uh, really groundbreaking initiatives in the mobile data industry. Uh, he has a degree from Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, to his immediate left is Jonathan uh, Buckley, who is the CEO and board member of ScanBy. And we'll be talking quite a bit about how this company helps uh, bridge the gap between the physical and the digital worlds. Uh, prior to that, he was a CEO of LifeMinders and uh, Barnes and & Nobles and led the IPO of BN.com. And he was also uh, nominated uh, twice by the World Economic uh, Forum and honored for his uh, contributions. And he has a degree uh, from Yale in African Studies. And uh, last but not least, uh, Rajiv Chand, a known um, analyst in the wireless space. Uh, his published research is read by uh, thousands of people, close to 80,000 or so around the world. And he has been um, on several uh, media publications like uh, Wall Street Journal and so on and so forth, and has a degree from Wharton. Uh, so t I guess to begin with, uh, I would like um, every panelist to um, give their opinion on where the industry is uh, today and what they see as some of the, the key technologies that will come to light in the next uh, two to three years. And maybe we'll start with, uh, with Rajiv. Thank, thanks, Jason. Um, and so, uh, so wireless, from our point of view, and it has nothing to do with the fact that I'm a wireless analyst, is, uh, is really exciting. Um, there are, uh, in venture capital and wireless, there's roughly $5.1 billion in annual venture capital spent in mobility. This is actually greater than the R&D budgets for Ericsson and for Alcatel, Lucent, and some of the other sort of vendors in the space. And so we do see significant innovation uh, across, um, across sort of the mobile space. Um, I see three macro trends, if you would, in mobility. Uh, the first, and this is something that we believe, is that mobile will be bigger than online. And this is not just, you know, in first screen nations like emerging markets. This is even here in the US. And the story that I give uh, for this is, I don't know if anybody saw this press release, but uh, for the last NFL weekend in December, uh, and I don't know if folks, uh, folks, um, uh, folks uh, follow the NFL or, or ESPN much, but during NFL seasons, during NFL games, ESPN online is a very well-trafficked site. Because guys like me are watching our football games and we're trying to figure out what the scores are for the other games or the stats. The last weekend of this NFL season saw more ESPN hits on their mobile phone site rather than on their online site. And so that's sort of, at least to me, a leading indicator that, um, and again, it's not all Disney sites by any stretch of the imagination. It's definitely an incident. Uh, but I do think there's something here about sort of mobility becoming greater than online. Uh, in the future. I think the second thesis is that, and I know my friend Gary is going gonna, is gonna to vociferously disagree with me on this, but that in the short term, you know, intellectually there's no such thing as a mobile internet. But on a practical basis, we do think the mobile internet exists in the short term. And examples that I would give, there's a company called uh, MocoSpace. I don't know if folks have heard of this. This company, MocoSpace, mobile social network, a billion page views a month already uh, on, its, on its mobile site. There's another company called AirG 
that has four and a half billion page views already on its mobile, mobile internet site. So we would argue the second main thesis sort of in mobile is that there is in the short term a mobile internet such that major new consumer brands will emerge. And the third thesis, and then I'll shut up here, uh, but the third thesis is, um, you know, clearly I think the mobile device is going from a communications device to a communications content and computing device. Uh, I think what we would argue and what we see, is a, lot, see a lot as well in the, in the uh, venture investment is that there's a third phase. And that third phase is what Docomo calls. Docomo is one of the leading carriers globally. It's the leading carrier in Japan. What Docomo calls lifestyle infrastructure. And that's things like personal assistance, personal finance, mobile retail. And the thing that's interesting is that we're now seeing, so clearly the second phase is happening. This third phase, we're starting to see visibility towards implementations. And I think Jonathan has a, has a great sort of illustration. One illustration that I uh, like personally, just as an anecdote, I was asking one of the internet uh, uh, incumbents at CTIA, a wireless conference, what's the most popular downloaded app through their site. And it turned out that one of the most popular downloaded sites was in Japan, where they have a remote control for TVs through your cell phone. And there's 30 million Japanese that have downloaded this and are now using their cell phones to control their TV. And actually, the reason that they gave was that the teenagers in these homes didn't want to wait for the parents to give over the remote. But nonetheless, I think you are seeing sort of the device bleed, if you would, well beyond sort of the traditional ways or the current ways of thinking about the device. And that's another, I think, major part of where venture capital and wireless is going. Uh, Jonathan, um, you've, you guys focus a lot on uh, connecting the digital and the physical world. And um, in Japan and Korea, people have been using uh, QR codes uh, and other forms of codes and images to uh, uh, track and download content, uh, but hasn't really taken off in, in Europe and North America um, to that extent. Uh, are you seeing anything different uh, that, that might indicate that um, a, the business models are wrong, or the infrastructure is not there, or uh, is there some other reason? Yeah, for that? and I know we're not supposed to do an ad for our company, so I won't. <laughs> I will talk about that, but let me segue from what Rajiv outlined. You know, I'm an old internet guy, and I started at AOL in 1993 when AOL had 250,000 subscribers. And if you turn your minds back to that point in time, there was Prodigy AOL and a couple other service providers in the US, and no internet service providers globally. And that was 15 years ago. And what I see in mobile is exactly what happened on the internet. The dynamics are exactly the same. So you had walled gardens of companies providing communication services, AOL, Prodigy, CompuServe. It was mostly email, chat, no content access or browsing, really, to any extent, and no advertising, no transactions. It was metered pricing. Three hours cost $6.95 a month. If you paid extra, if you went over, you paid extra. All subscriber revenue, no ad revenue, no commerce revenue. That was 1993. By 1996 or 1997, what had happened? Well, everything went flat rate, right? Unlimited access. So all of a sudden, the subscriber revenues were capped. Does this sound familiar in mobile today? Exactly the same. You know, the ISPs, Verizon, Sprint, et cetera, are in the same business models. The next phase is advertising and commerce growth. No question about it. Question is, who's going to get the $1 trillion of value that will inure here? Is it Google, who's worth $175 billion now, and Earthlink, who's worth $1 billion? So the ISPs of the old days ended up with nothing, bupkis, as they say in New York. <laughs> and Google and Yahoo and Amazon ended up with all the cash, generally. Well, the good news is, we've all seen the movie before, so we know what's going to happen, generally. We just don't know who's going to get it. And that tussle over the next couple of years is what all of this is about. So stay tuned and watch. Now, we play a minor role right now. It's pretty exciting because the major problem that I see on the phone on these things that we're carrying around is how do you navigate? You know, these small devices aren't really built to navigate via a portal structure where you go to a main page, do something and then click down 10 levels and back up and down again and back up. These devices are great. They're wirelessly connected. They're ubiquitous. They display information pretty well. But they're best suited when you know what you want to get and you go right to it. It's not built for browsing. So our solution that Chetton outlined is uh, pretty simple. We use the camera on the phone as the navigation device. 
and we believe that everything in the world will be navigable, and you just point your camera at a visual cue, which in our case is a two-dimensional barcode, and with one click, you go directly to the information associated with that code. Now, if that were be to become ubiquitous, you can just imagine everything is navigable. This bottle of water, one click, and I can go to whatever Aquafina wants me to go to. Business cards, you scan the card, the information gets downloaded and stored on my phone. I'm at a restaurant, I want the review, I scan that restaurant's barcode, get that review, one click on my phone. Now, that's pretty exciting. In Japan, it's worked well. The US carriers, it appears, will launch in July this year. Several European carriers are launching over the next couple months. So this top technology is coming to a, a window near you very soon. <laughs> Japan has been very successful with it so far. Let me uh, uh, go to Hugh and then I'll come back to uh, Gary. Um, we talked a bit about the business model and sort of the ecosystem dynamics around uh, open garden and closed garden. And at last, CTIA, Arun Sarin said, we definitely don't want to be dumb pipes. We want to add intelligence to those pipes. Uh, clearly, you, you have, in the past, you have talked about context and how carriers can add value by personalizing services uh, to not only regular applications like ringtone and graphics, but pretty much anything that happens on the mobile phone. <laughs> Where do you see that evolving to, and what role does the carrier play in the ecosystem from that perspective? Right. Um, by the way, we do, we've launched um, barcode scanning, so I just wanted to get that one yeah. in. Um, we, um, you know, the mobile, inter uh, mobile internet, as uh, Rajiv says, is, uh, really has started to take off the deployments, the commercial deployments of HSPA over the last three years in Europe and um, uh, parts of America and, of course, Australia have really seen a, an uptake of uh, mobile internet. Um, it's, depending on the part of the world you live in, it's not really a, a walled garden as such. Mm -hmm. It's both a walled garden and an unwalled sure. garden. But, what has everyone salivating is this notion that you can get a very defined context for the user and that you can therefore deliver information to the user in the form of advertising that's actually something they want to get as opposed to something that's being pushed onto them. There, there are sort of two bumps in the road in my view on that and there's one potential twist in the road. So the two bumps are, um, and I guess I disagree with Rajiv on this, the handset ecosystem is, uh, is in an absolutely shocking state. Um, if you want to develop software for a handset, there are roughly 300 different platforms you've actually got to tailor that software for and that's unsustainable. And people will point to the Apple iPhone and say, you know, that's changed the game. It has changed the game, but it's actually worsened the fragmentation. Mm -hmm. So that's a significant issue. The, the second significant issue is I can absolutely guarantee that someone somewhere will foul up the privacy issues and alienate uh, consumers and create uh, suspicion. But I think uh, potentially the twist in the road that's going to be most, most interesting is the phenomenon known as crowdsourcing, which is just starting to take off now. So you see uh, the notion that everyone's carrying a device, that device is able to report back via the broadband connection, the state of the user, whether they're, you know, whether it's their movement in a car or whether they're doing a shopping um, transaction and the price of the, and the item they've just bought. And therefore, you can gather a collective state or you could use the state of bushfires um, in the same way. But any shared human endeavor, you can actually crowdsource the information and therefore give people perfect state information about the world they're living in. And the way in which they're going to respond to that, I think, is a complete unknown and will probably have a, a significant impact on these advertising spaces because people will be crowdsourcing the information as opposed to taking it from corporates and that's going to change the game uh, entirely. Uh, you talked a bit about advertising and uh, that's what uh, Gary focuses uh, day in and day out. Um, last time we made projections around uh, advertising, we were way off uh, and currently the projections are close to 20 billion or so um, by year 2011-12. Uh, so two or three questions around that. A, uh, ha has, ha have things changed uh, in the last two to three years from a mobile advertising perspective? Is it a viable model uh, for media going forward? Will it replicate what happens on TV and Internet? Uh, and um, the ecosystem dynamics, um, you know, do the online players uh, do it on their own till they get reach uh, or work with the carriers? Uh, so how, how do you th view that? playing out both short-term and long-term. Sure. So first to the projection point, Mark's prescience notwithstanding and the ability of this group to sometimes be ahead of the curve uh, in 
couple of decades in this industry, we've gotten every prediction wrong. And you know, the, the classic quote is, we're always, you know, we, we assume there's a short distance in front of us to the opportunity, we're always wrong. And the opportunity is, as Vinod showed us last night, how wrong those predictions can be about the size of the ultimate opportunity. So I think all the studies that I see and read about mobile advertising suffer from that same flaw. Um, to, to the superior question and to sort of tie into what the, the guys have said here, I, I look at us as being in the midst of a fascinating transformational period in the wireless industry. And as you alluded to in the intro, I've been in this game since 1989. I have all the arrow marks down my back for having been a pioneer over and over again. So, you know, take everything I say with a healthy shake <coughs> full of salt. But fundamentally, the phone remains, first and foremost, a communication device. And today, it's a $700 billion industry for guys like yourselves to be able to sell us the ability to consume minutes and talk to each other and or send uh, bits in the form of text messaging. And that's the dominant business model still for every player in the space. But as Mark touched on in his opening comments last night, the nature of human, human communication is changing itself. And you talked about the youth and how connected they are and multilingual they are and have friends and folks they talk to across borders and in the geographically connected village we've become. So just as the way we as individuals communicate is changing, so is the mobile industry and the mobile ecosystem. And so what's happening is now the phone is becoming about uh, on the go, access to information anywhere, anytime, when you want it. It's becoming about sharing and collaborating with other folks, and it's becoming about managing media and content and being able to bring that to yourself, whether it's crowdsourced or corporate sourced or, or you know, personal sourced from your library at home. So if you look at it in that sense, it is on the verge of becoming a truly mass medium. Well, and you touch on this in your book, in, in all of history, every mass medium that has preceded us has ultimately either been ad-supported, ad-funded, or it's all about the advertising, and mobile is very quickly becoming the same way. And so, so, so do you think, uh, you know, what uh, Eric Smith said uh, a few months ago, phone should be free, and some MVNOs uh, in Europe are trying that model? You see do that, Blick, Blick's trying it, you know, Virgin's done it with Sugar Mama, there are clearly a number of experiments in that way. Uh, you know, we, through the internet experience, and you know, Jonathan's seen it, the movie, um, we have conditioned folks to expect services and content will come to them either cheap or gratis. And when you condition folks to expect that, there has to be a business model behind it somewhere, and ultimately, advertising becomes the fuel for that economy. But, so, you know, just UK people, everybody remembers FreeServe that was introduced <laughs> when I left AOL UK in 97. You know, the same model, it was advertising will subsidize everything. There's no reason that it has to. They're great models. Subscribers will pay for services, for communication services. There's a great subscriber revenue line for years and years and years to come. So advertising is just the high margin business. You know, Google is not a subscriber model, right? And it's worth $175 <laughs> billion. Yeah. So. The, the thing that's scary about advertising, well, there's lots of things that are scary about advertising. But the thing that I think is particularly scary about advertising from a telco perspective, if you look at the global advertising budget, wireless and wireline, I mean, a, a physical and digital, it's about $500 billion, $600 billion, $700 billion. Of that, the digital portion is roughly 30 billion, 40 billion. Now take wireless telco revenues globally. That's 700 billion dollars. So we're talking about 700 billion dollar wireless services business, and we're talking about a 30 billion dollar online advertising market. I mean, if you're a telco, this thing doesn't add up to a hell of beans. You know, it adds up to maybe one or two beans, but definitely not a hell of beans. And yeah, so, but what's the margin on the advertising side? Yeah. So then you get into the margin argument. But the margin argument for So let's have this. Let's play it oh, out. Oh, absolutely. No, let's play it out. Let's play it out. So the, the difficulty is the margin is great if you've got an ISP-based uh, cost structure. If you've still got the telco cost structure, a dollar of revenue is a dollar of revenue. Right. And the next argument that I hear, which I think is fascinating as well, is shareholder value. Hey, listen, you know, that dollar of advertising will give you X multiple on your sort of revenue, your, your shareholder value. And what I hear the telco say in return is, you know what, that just, that the Google, Yahoo uh, stock valuations are just a, uh, you know, we've been in business for 200 years and it's an, that's, aberration. it's an aberration. 
And so I think advertising is interesting. I think advertising is exciting. Uh, uh, and by the way, we're bullish on all of our theses here, so just FYI. But secondly, uh, I do think from a telco perspective, I hear a lot more cold water on this than I hear you know, real excitement and exuberance. Can I, uh, can sure. I follow that up? Because I absolutely agree with you, Rajiv. When we look at the global advertising industry in comparison with the global telecommunications industry, depending on whose figures you believe, it's roughly one-tenth to one-fifth of the size of the telco industry. And when we build a network, you know, we have real costs. We have spectrum costs. We have base stations. We have network costs. We have operational workforce. We're not just gouging money out of our subscribers. We're actually delivering a service which costs us real money. And there's no way in the world in which you can actually substitute those revenues and pay for that infrastructure and that service with advertising. So when Google made a big fuss about um, buying Spectrum, we were scratching our heads because uh, there was no way in the world that their revenues, forget about their stock price, maybe they could have cashed in their stock and paid for a network, but their revenues would not justify in any way or form a, um, a, a network. And I guess, uh, Jonathan, going back to unlimited flat plans, um, that's probably the biggest disaster that's hit the European and um, um, US ISP industries because it's not going to fund the next round of investment that you're going to need in order to upgrade the technology and the backhaul and the broadband to get uh, the delivery of video services, which are the next wave of technology and applications hitting the market. And here's actually maybe where I would very kindly disagree with my friend Hugh. You know, um, <laughs> me too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I, you know, Hugh, I could be wrong, but you know, I think it's just an eventuality the telco has become dumb pipes. And you know, there's some degree of intelligence which I think creates kind of a smart pipe enabler business model. Uh, and I hear what you're saying about sort of CapEx and sort of the, the needs of that, but I think we've heard this story before too. I'm having a flashback. <laughs> this is a panel in 1994 with AT&T, I think. But um, so what's advertising this is a big question. You know, if I go into a, a Best Buy, and I use my camera phone and scan the Sony TV and get information on it and then can click buy. You know, is that advertising? You know, and I actually buy it and because I have an account at Best Buy, I enter my username, password, they have my credit card and billing information, shipping is stored and it ships to me and in three clicks, I just bought a 62 inch TV with my cell phone. That's gonna happen in a year or two. Is that advertising? No, that's commerce transactions. So I think when we talk about you know, the internet model being non -all, not all subscriber based, it's all the transactions that happen, all the e-commerce transactions, it's all the clicks, it's all the click throughs, it's all the CPC costs, that's all wrapped in. And that number is a lot bigger than 30 or $40 billion worldwide. It's hundreds of billions of dollars worldwide. I'm looking so, at um, So, a little bigger pie. I, I feel I am um, being yeah, yeah, compared to AT&T in 1982 worries me a bit. So <laughs> I'm, I'm leaping to the defense here. Yeah, um, that's good. This we've we got to get these guys awake. I, I think it's awake? a mistake to uh, regard a telco as a pipe provider. What we do is we offer a service, and that service includes identity, billing, authentication, service assurance, provisioning. Those are the things that... So in your scenario of going into Best Buy, we're actually a channel to market for Best Buy and for other players. And that, the reason why we're the, the channel is because of that identity identity aspect to it. We know who you are, and if you don't pay your bill, we cut you off. There's a, a very um, simple business model in the telco industry, and it's been like that for 120 years, and probably not going to go away for 120 years, because someone has to do that. And but in the transaction I outlined, I wasn't charging it to your bill. Fair enough. I was yeah. logging on to Best Buy's site, and, you know, Charging to my credit Let's, card. Let's uh, maybe perhaps move on some uh, other uh, other topics uh, around. <laughs> Chaitanya's like Hugh is never coming again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, say, say you have uh, 50 million to invest in certain aspects, uh, either new business models or technologies. Knowing what you know about the industry, which are two or three key areas, looking at the time horizon of three to five years, where would you invest? Uh, start with you. Well, um, you'd certainly inge invest in the next generation of broadband technology, HSPA From a plus LTE, um, because those are going to be the key enablers. That for will the require a lot of investment, though. But the second level, it is a big investment. The second level investment is the service delivery layer on uh -huh. top of that, the, the infrastructure to, to tie together all the reusable and en enablers, the tra commerce transactions, the identity system, the, the billing systems, etc. To tie that together as a reusable platform, just as the network is a platform today. 
So sort of enable the platform more for the services on top of them? Exactly. Okay. Gary? So th the answer to the question depends on who the investor is. Sure. Uh, if, to Hugh's point, if you're investing in the next generation of wireless broadband technology and you know Intel's in the audience and other folks, that makes a ton of sense. I guess if you're one of Rajiv's clients and, and you're more you, you you know you have fifty million and based on what you know about the industry, about the which specific uh, areas are hot, where would you invest that uh, fifty million? So number one, we think open's going to win. Uh -huh. And you need to place your bets in a world where the walled gardens come down, proprietary standards begin to uh, dissipate in terms of the strength and the hold they have in the marketplace. And, and that argues you innovate around the edges mm -hmm. and try to find opportunities. So for example, to, if I want to sell aspirin to Hugh, uh, part of it becomes how do I unlock the value of all those things an operator knows mm -hmm. about their subscriber base and allow them to leverage what they know to help fuel these incremental business models that are beginning to evolve. And, and that, by the way, is the fallacy of that thread we just went through, is to view these as either or business models. They're all additive. Sure. And so um, commerce and transactions, advertising, are additive to the subscription basis that the telcos already have. So the challenge so for them not to be the dumb pipe that Rajiv thinks they're going to be is how do you unlock all that value that is stored away in islands of information that are not connected today inside a telco world and bring those and present those out to the rest of the ecosystem in order to fuel the evolution of the, of the business plans. From an openness perspective, you know, Yahoo has this initiative and Google has this initiative, AOL also announced. So are we just getting, moving to a world where we are just aggregating the fragmentation into small islands? And that's the way it's going to be, or it's going to be you know, one or two major platforms that people can build application on. I, I think the three examples you give are very different examples, and I won't presume to speak for the other companies. Uh, you know, from our perspective, we looked at it and said, you know, the world doesn't need another phone operating system. To Hugh's point, there's already way too many platforms. We've chosen to try to solve that at a different level, and what we're doing with the mobile widget platform is. Uh, making it simpler for folks that have content and services and want to bring them to the mobile environment to write once, deploy them anywhere, and thus try to have a running start at reach and critical mass scale in order to turn it into a business. So we do that today. I don't really care whether you run on Symbian or RIM or iPhone or Windows Mobile or Android when it's real. I don't really care about all that. Um, you know, we, we want to make it easier for you to bring your stuff to the mobile world to help fuel these, what we call mobile first experiences, as this becomes a true medium for all of us that is separate and distinct and blurred at the same time with what we do on the PC, so. Jonathan? I'll keep it short and simple, which is we learned from the first phase that whoever co controls the traffic and can monetize it, wins. So whoever controls the traffic and monetizes it in the next phase, wins. If I had $50 million to invest, I would invest in controlling and monetizing traffic on mobile. Um, uh, I think, uh, personally, what I think is the most interesting is all the consumer mobile applications. It's really interesting, jumping back to kind of mid-90s, you look at some of the startups today that have mobile applications, and you look at their traffic curves for the last six months, not next six months, last six months, they all look like hockey sticks, or many of them, you know, at least two dozen I can think of. You look at their traffic curves, they look like hockey sticks. And this has got to be a precedent to something interesting. We have about uh, 40 seconds left. Uh, maybe we can take one or two questions from the audience. 43. <laughs> <laughs> but they yes. gypped us for a minute. Yes. One uh, quick add to, that I think wasn't mentioned in the discussion and uh, is the, the, the nature of uh, how personal these devices are for people. And I think when we talk about advertising, you know, disruption is, is, is not a good thing, right? So push or pull advertising and whatnot is important. How much people are going to be willing to open up these devices um, to the kinds of things that we're discussing is yet to be determined, right? Consumer behavior that we don't really understand. My uh, second question is, um, in, uh, there, there's really two trends on these things. One, one claims specialization, and you see something like the BlackBerry, which is the ultimate email device, and uh, it's won on that vertical, and I think everybody can look at it today, and it's been a huge win, right? The next one that uh, appears lately is Kindle. Kindle is a specialized mobile device that is, is well dedicated to one thing, which kind of marches against the idea of the utilitarian uh, version of the mobile device that does everything but does nothing very well. Uh, what are you guys' perspective on which one of the two are, are likely to prevail? 
Hugh, do you have a view on uh, the role of alternate devices in the ecosystem? I think there's going to be a mixture of um, multi-purpose devices. You know, I have this N95, which is the phone du jour, and you know, I was keen on it because it looks like a camera. It's an awful camera. It's an awful MP3 player. <laughs> it's a reasonable phone. Um, so I still carry a separate car camera, and I carry an iPod. Um, there's the, but this thing is always with me, so if I'm desperate to take a picture, I use it. But um, uh, there's always going to be that mixture of specialized and uh, multi-purpose devices. So on pull versus push, you know, this device should be mainly pull. It should not be a push device. But in pull, when I want to choose to interact with this, I think it's really great if I go and scan the Mercedes ad that they know I'm in New York City and when I click to see where the dealer is, I get the one on 9th Avenue, not in Los Angeles. So that can be customized and pushed back, but it's based on my requesting that information and interaction. Then if I choose to give them my information, call me to sign up for a test drive or something else. That's my choice. And I can give them that information simply, and that's the best model. This should not be a push device. If it is, we will ruin it. And the ad revenue and e-commerce revenue will not happen. With that, uh, we'll end the session here. And uh, thanks. thanks for your uh, point of views and right. sure. insights. Thanks. Thank